why is it important to engage your audience? Why is engaging them important? What do we mean by that? Why is that important? So what do y'all think? And everyone doesn't need to talk all at once, but we definitely need you to think about it. Why is it important? Why should you care about engaging your audience? Isn't it? So Debbie said to feel welcome, a member of the group, and to keep their attention. What do y'all think about that? Other ideas? To get your message across. If you're not engaging them, your message may not actually really come across. Absolutely. And engaged audiences learn more and they remember more. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are all great answers. So to inspire them. Absolutely. And they have to be interested and involved in order to learn. So <laughs> engaging an audience means involving them, bringing them with you. Wonderful, wonderful. Rather than just talking at them. And to have a meaningful conversation, very much so. It brings the audience into the conversation. Make sure that they understand your message and want to know more. Perfect. Engaging your audience is important for inclusivity. It's important because your engaged audience will retain the information better. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Let's go ahead on, um, and do the next question, Sherelle. Thank you, Delia. It helps them to get to know you better and gives them an opportunity to let you know what they want and need from you. So yes, absolutely. All of these things, they learn more, they'll retain the information more, it's more inclusive, they get more involved, you get to know them, they get to know you. Next question is here, what is one challenge that you might experience if you were trying to engage audiences virtually online, like what we're doing right now. What's a challenge? Why might it be a little bit harder to engage audiences virtually? Yep, absolutely. You're missing the full scope of body language, so you can't see their bodies. You can't see their faces in many cases. They, they can't see you. It's, you might be doing some hand motions, but you might have some communication issues there. What else? Audio and video lag. Technical. Yes, technological barriers, weak internet connection. They may not be able to participate as fully. Um, it's very easy to be doing other things, you know, and they, it's harder to keep their attention, right? Uh, it's very difficult giving a talk with the whole audience on mute and not sharing their videos. You can't tell what they're feeling or thinking or saying. Other people might be distracting them. The children might be coming downstairs and asking you to make them their pizza or, and if, English is not your first language. You might have um, a bit of difficulty. <coughs> you lose something in the translation. <coughs> it's hard to determine whether you've lost them, whether they understand what you're saying. <coughs> um, Yolanda, if anyone is posting things from this question on the Google Doc, could you paste it into here? Um, um, and, and just, just paste it in if anybody's sharing on the Google Doc. Multitasking, many of us multitask. Um, and you can't tell whether people are confused, disengaged. And accessibility, absolutely. Can they hear you? Can they understand you? Is their internet cutting out and, or have you excluded part of your intended audience by doing things virtually? All of these things are potential problems. So, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's try to address some of these. That's what we're going to be doing for the next uh, 50 minutes. Sherelle, can we go to the next slide, please? So, there are uh, four of us who are going to be sharing some thoughts and some input to help address some of these challenges. Uh, with us today and we're going to kind of go around and introduce ourselves. Paige, would you care to speak first, please? Sure. My name is Paige Graff and I work at the NASA Johnson Space Center as part of the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division. And I come at this from having a former uh, classroom um, background. I'm a former classroom teacher, but I've also done a lot of virtual engagements with many of our scientists. And so hopefully the things that I have to share with you will strike a chord with you, whether you're presenting and engaging with audiences virtually, or even think about some of those same points that I'll discuss when you're engaging with audiences in person. 
So a lot of my experience comes from hands-on experience, and I hope you're able to take some good things away from that. Thank you so much, Paige. Um, Stacy, please introduce yourself. So, hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Tdkin. Uh, I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Solar System Exploration Division at Goddard Space Flight Center. And my background is actually in astrophysics, but I really liked um, talking to the public in grad school, so that's why I'm now uh, an outreach coordinator. So I mostly do in-person events, but obviously that has changed a bit now, so I've been focusing more on adapting our in-person activities to be virtual. Um, so I'm hoping that what I talked about today will also be helpful for the new, new normal that we're finding ourselves in. Thank you so much, Stacy. Sherelle. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherelle Webb. I'm the newest member of the education team at the LPI. And um, what I contribute to this talk today would definitely be our successes and our um, not failures, but the lessons that we've learned when launching our newest virtual program, which I will talk about later. Thank you so much. And, and I'm Christine Schupla. Nice to meet uh, many of you. I know many of you already. I'm uh, the Education and Public Engagement Manager at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And we are, we are honored to have all of you with us today. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And the next slide is about tools, about tools that you might be able to use. Um, so, in addition to the polls, which we've already tested a couple of, uh, we've already uh, tested one question of, and the chat box, which many of you are using, there are also symbols. So, so we've got a lot of tools that you might be able to use virtually. Does anyone know of any other tools that I haven't mentioned here that you can think of? What, what other tools might you be able to use in a virtual program that aren't listed here? Um, any thoughts? Please feel free. Again, speak up out loud or feel free to type it in. Screen sharing, yes, absolutely. You can absolutely share your screen. Um, we can even do whiteboards and have people draw and things like that. And some types of uh, technology offers a Q&A area where you can keep track of all the questions that might come in. Yes, some of the tools do have, have Q&A where you can separate the questions from the chat and um, breakout rooms. Yes, Ring Central does uh, enable breakout rooms as well um, where you can uh, have smaller group discussions. So those are great tools uh, that might enable small groups to meet and, and have discussions good ideas. Let's go ahead and get to the next slide. And Paige, you are up. Awesome. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And like I mentioned earlier when I was introducing myself, you know, the topics that I want to talk to you about today, these six different topics, I highly encourage that you think about these practices, whether you're connecting with audiences virtually or in person. And some of this stuff you may actually already know and might be like, oh yeah, I think about that all the time. But sometimes hearing it again and thinking of the perspective of doing things virtually can be really powerful. So Cheryl, if you go to the next slide, I first want to start talking about audience. And anytime you're connecting with an audience, as I wait for that next slide to pop up. Anytime you're connecting to an audience, you really want to think about, um, here we go, who you're connecting with. Are they students? If they are, what grade level? Elementary, middle school, high school, college, whatever the grade level is. Are you connecting with adults or families or a mixed audience of educators and their students or older folks and younger folks on the line? You really need to know who you're chatting with, who you're connecting with, so you can gauge the terminology that you use, the vocabulary that you use, so you're not intimidating your audience, you're enabling them to be able to all be on the same page and understand what you're chatting about. If you lose them with vocabulary, you probably lost them for good. So make sure you know that audience so that you can really kind of monitor how you're talking with them. 
But secondly, you also want to think about how many. If you're chatting with 10 people in one room, the way in which you communicate with them may be different than if you're chatting with 100 people distributed in different locations around the nation. So you sort of have to think about how do you make a call on especially the communication techniques. You know, 61 people or so on the line here, if we all started unmuting and chatting at the same time, it would, it would get crazy. So you need to think about how many folks you might have on the line, especially with your communication through that virtual engagement. The third thing that I think is so important also is context and purpose. Why are these people connecting with you? Are they connecting with you because they're going to do a hands-on activity? Or are they connecting with you because you want to help them build their background knowledge about the latest and greatest going on with some type of mission? You need to really think about that context and purpose because that will also drive how you choose to communicate with them, how you choose to have them communicate with you, and of course, the content in your presentation. Second thing I just want to mention is getting started. Anytime, you know, especially in this day and age, you join these meetings and you're like, wait, am I in the right place? Is this the right time? Where am I? Wait, who? you know, you want to sort of set the stage and let the audience know they're in the right place. When we run webinars, and we do quite a few webinars out of the Astro Materials Division, we always have a slide that kind of says, Here's the topic and the presentation you're joining us for, as well as the date and the time so that they know they're in the right place and at the right time. But we also pose a question to encourage participants to start interacting. And this can be really important for a couple of reasons. One, it makes uh, folks know that you want them to communicate with you. And we oftentimes do this, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before a presentation starts, where we encourage people to join in early, make sure that they're set up and that they know all the tools and they can hear and they can see, but then we want to encourage them to interact. And as they do interact, when people comment on their comments, whether it's in the chat room itself or um, a panelist who is commenting on some of the um, items coming into the chat, that really sort of encourages others to want to join in. Everyone these days wants to share a little bit about themselves, at least many of our participants do, whether it's where are you, how's your weather, or what do you hope to learn during today's webinar. So some folks choose not to participate, and they're sort of silent observers, but if you can get those to participate and get involved in that chat, that can be really important. The third point I'll make is, you know, with your connection rules, keep them consistent. If you're meeting with 100 folks on the line and you say that everyone's going to communicate only using the chat, then stick to that. It keeps things fair. It keeps everyone on the same page. And as we can see, even with Ring Central, some of us can see the chat, but some of us cannot. So we need to be aware of those types of things for communication. And if there is some sort of challenge, we need to be able to address that. And then the last point I'll make is we always like to show sort of a screenshot on the slide itself as people are joining in to let the participants know about the tools they can and should use during the session. Sometimes people just don't know where is the chat. How do I find the Q&A? How do I raise my hand? So in that beginning 10 to 15 minutes as we're waiting to officially get started, we make sure people can find those tools, use those tools, so we're not wasting any time once we actually officially get started. Cheryl, if you go to the next slide. The third thing I actually want to talk about and mention is something that I think is so important, and it's introductions. Sometimes when a speaker is going to give a talk, somebody else introduces them. In my opinion, when we're connecting with an audience virtually, they're there to hear from the featured presenter. And that featured presenter, when they introduce themselves, should really try to make themselves real. 
Now, the couple of slides, the pictures on the bottom here, the two, the one on the left and the one in the middle, are from John Gruner, where he is sharing a little bit about where he's from, his educational background, pictures of him in action, as well as that middle picture kind of helps show and allow him to tell the story of how he was inspired as a little kid to eventually pursue a STEM career. And so those stories, and even that picture on the right, that's actually Ben Feist as a little boy. And when he gave a presentation, he gave some of his background, but then he went to this picture where he told the audience his story of how his passion about science and STEM started when he was a little kid, hanging out with his sister, playing with Legos and robots. And so his story might connect with one of the folks that you're connecting with to allow them to be like, oh, I love Legos too, or I love robots too, or you know, maybe I could be this person in the future. Now, the other point I'll make here is to let them see you as the speaker. Now, in my case, I can't share my camera on my, um, on my, on my screen, on my NASA computer. So putting a little picture in the corner of the slide helps people know who's talking to you. Because it's kind of a little nicer to be able to see who is talking to you rather than just have this picture on a screen that you don't even know who's sharing their information with you. So if you go to the next slide, Sherelle. Paige, so I'll just reinforce. Um, we've got a question um, that I wanted to let you address before you continue. Um, the, the question is, um, what are your thoughts on how to control a heated discussion during a webinar when the moderator isn't being heard? <laughs> so any heated discussion, and that's a really great question. Anytime there's some sort of um, um, uh, where you can kind of ascertain that, ooh, somebody's not all that happy with what's going on, you really just have to try to um, do your best to get it under control and make it more of a positive situation. Now, I'm not sure when the moderator isn't being heard, um, I'm not exactly sure what that really means. Um, but anytime I would say that sometimes in the chat, people start to maybe comment or put in an answer to a question and they almost seem as though, oh my gosh, um, they don't, think we should go back to the moon and now they're starting to rile up the troops in the rest of this you know session who are also saying yeah why are we going to the moon and blah 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 being able to take control of that and turn it into the positives of why it is a good idea to do this that or another thing is always a, a good thing to aim to do either as the moderator themselves or as the presenter who can be alerted to some of that sort of concern uh, in the chat. So I, I hope I kind of answered that question and please feel free to put another follow-up in the chat so that I can um, clarify that answer if I, if I didn't do it suitably. Thanks Paige. Sure. So in terms of content, and again, this is something that I'm sure you all do whether you're presenting in person or virtually, but especially when it's virtual, you really need to draw them in and keep them interested. This slide on the right comes from Uliana Gross, who actually gave a presentation to a mixed group of elementary, middle school, and high school kids, and some of this, and their teachers, and some of this content is a little high level. But with a balance of pictures and words and using terminology, explaining it and reusing it in a gentle, non-threatening way, you're able to actually build the vocabulary of your audiences and build their content knowledge. And so a slide like this, you know, it has a good little mix. And sometimes you might even just have a slide with just pure pictures on it. Now, in terms of props, if you're going to use a prop to be able to showcase something, just keep in mind that a picture on the screen may be clearer than you showing an object on your camera. Depending on the, um, the clarity of what you might be showing, a prop that you're like so excited about, your audience may not see very clearly. But a picture of it in correspondence with the prop perhaps 
might be a good thing to do as well. Another point I'll make is, you know, if you're excited about what you're presenting, your audience is going to be excited as well. I realize that you have to be you, and so some of you might be like, well, I kind of talk in general on an even keel and an even tone, and that's okay. They'll feel from sort of the, the um, aspects of what you're sharing and how you're sharing it that you love what you do. And if you can kind of portray that through a screen, it really can come across quite well. And the last point I'll make on this slide is if you consider having um, someone review your presentation to give you input, I highly recommend it. Because what you might think is perfect and hits all the marks, you might not be thinking about, oh, you know what? Do you think people are going to understand that term or that word? And so getting input from others can be very powerful, especially on interactions. And if you go to the next slide, Sherelle, interactions to me is one of the um, artful aspects of engaging audiences virtually. And as we think about um, uh, these interactions, we can have a chat, there's a Q&A, there's a raise hand feature. My recommendation in most interactions is to have them be in a sense silent. I know that kind of sounds like, wait, you don't want people to say anything? They can say it in the chat. And that voice gives them a chance to kind of say what's on their mind without necessarily having a fear of, do I want to unmute my mic? Is it the right time to unmute my mic? So silent interactions can be powerful, but don't let it overtake what the presenter is sharing. I've been in meetings where the chat is going nonstop, and I can't read the chat and listen to the presenter at the same time, so I lose out. And I think for many of the audiences we may connect with, that would happen with them as well. So when we run a webinar, we use the chat at the beginning of the session, tell us who you are, tell us what you want to learn, converse, converse, converse. Once the session starts, we let our folks know only use the chat to communicate with, with and answer questions that a presenter may be sharing. That keeps things focused, that keeps things um, on target. And even with the Q&A, we will most often hold all the questions to the end. So we don't like derail a conversation or get things going on a different track that the presenter may be wanting to talk about. So we always, in most cases, keep our questions to the end. And a raise hand is a very quick thing. Hey, can you hear me? Can you see me? Raise your hand and it gets people kind of playing with the tools as well. But this next point about periodically asking questions to keep folks engaged, this is perhaps the most important, yes, yet the most challenging thing to deal with. Now, some of the reasons are, um, and I'll, I'll mention some of these points. Anytime we're going to have a presenter at ARIES give a, a webinar or virtually engage an audience, I always recommend that they insert four to five questions into a 45-minute presentation. But the thing about those questions is they must be open-ended. And we must have a time to be able to share those responses and acknowledge answers. People, in general, they want to know that their voices have been heard. So if you read their answer, if you name a school or a library, if that's how they're joining a particular session, they love to hear what they put into the chat and that it is being acknowledged. And we also try to relate the questions and the answers to the audience. So these two little slides here down on the bottom left, practice, practice, practice. This is a, a question that Uliana Gross actually asked during a webinar she did in March, where she talked about practicing opening this lunar core before doing it for real. So she posed the question, hey, why is practice important? And we got all sorts of answers in the chat. And they were great answers that revolved around situations we would have never even thought about but that's the power of getting that sort of response from people that come at things from a different perspective. But as we read those answers and we brought it sort of connected to, their, to, their, to the audience, 
we reinforce the fact that whether you're preparing for an athletic competition, an academic competition, a recital of some sort, you've got to practice because you've got one shot to do things the best that you can. And so we kind of try to relate it to things the audience may have experienced themselves. Now on the right, that question is, seems to be a multiple choice question, and it is. But the most important part of that question is the explain your answer. Even when we pose a question like this, we let our audiences know. I'm not as much interested as your A, B, C, D answer as I am in why. Explain your answer, justify your answer. We want to encourage them to think scientifically to justify their answers and really start a, a, a thinking process. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. And the last thing I'll say about interactions is, you know, allow time for Q&A. If people, you're, you're generally, hopefully, you know, instilling curiosity in folks. And you want to give them the chance to ask questions so you can answer them. A lot of times things go way too long, like I might be going too long, so I'll cut this off real soon. But allow time for that Q&A, because that's a very valuable thing. And in terms of a facilitator, for example, that slide, that image on the right, we're going to be hosting a webinar. If you want to see a, a webinar in action with a, an audience of maybe 200 folks, you can feel free to sign up for that. Liz Rampey is going to be our speaker. But we'll use two facilitators so that Liz can focus on what she's there to do, share her content, answer questions, ask questions. Uh, and so if you can use a facilitator and your comfort level says, I need a facilitator, use that asset. And the last thing in interactions I would say is you want to be able to share information on where your audience can go to learn more. After they disconnect with you, you don't want their curiosity to end. You want to encourage them to explore more, to find out additional information about what they've learned about. So whether you share that in links or a slide with possible links or a follow-up email, that can be really useful to enable them to continue their quest to learn about your particular topic. And lastly, I'd say be prepared. Plan, test, and deliver. You got to know how to use the technology. Don't experience it for the first time the day you're running the event, or that just could be very um, cumbersome. Test ahead of time with you, your speaker, and even your audience, and always have a backup plan. It's always a good idea for a backup plan. So with that, I'll leave it there, and Christine, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Paige. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we can practice using our symbols. There's a little symbol for clapping. <laughs> um, Let's go to the next slide, and Stacy's going to be talking, and I should point out that uh, there was a, a comment here about seconding the use of a facilitator, that it goes really well when you, uh, Paul has mentioned working with Paige on several of his webinars, that using a facilitator is really helpful. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, I promise. Stacy. Awesome, thanks, Christine. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about pre-recorded versus live events and some pros and cons of each, along with some general tips for engagement in a virtual setting, which a lot of will reiterate what Paige just mentioned. Um, so pre-recorded versus live events, there are different ways in which to engage the public in a virtual setting. You can have pre-recorded content, live content, or even a blend of the two, as Christine's poll just showed, um, and each has their own pros and cons. So I'm just gonna list a few um, pros and cons of each. There are a lot, um, but I didn't wanna talk forever. <laughs> so depending on the complexity of the event, hosting it live is more prone to technical difficulties, um, but these can be overcome if you do um, multiple test runs and practice um, and some trials, because you don't wanna start an event when you haven't practiced or like used the tool. Um, before, which is what Paige just mentioned. And pre-recorded events enable people to do multiple takes as well um, in order to perfect their delivery. So this is especially great for those who aren't comfortable with um, presenting to a live audience. Um, the live aspect is more engaging with folks in the moment though, because you can directly interact with the audience as you're speaking. And it also, pre-recorded videos don't have that 
Q&A aspect that's so important. Um, doing an audience Q&A is very beneficial and helps you uh, better engage with participants. This isn't really possible in a pre-recorded presentation, but you can have people submit questions directly um, beforehand and then answer them in a video that is then sent out to, say, a classroom or a library program. This isn't as engaging as a live Q&A, but it does help the audience feel more involved with your presentation. Um, so there are also ways to incorporate both a pre-recorded and a live aspect into a virtual engagement event. Um, so Sherelle, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so one example of a recent blended event is that um, of AwesomeCon, so, which is Washington, D.C.'s version of, of uh, Comic-Con. So San Diego's great Comic-Con. Uh, so this year's event was actually postponed due to the pandemic. So instead, the AwesomeCon coordinating committee held a live event on their Facebook page, which was called AwesomeCon Online. So our participation was done in a blended fashion where we, uh, so me and a few Goddard scientists and engineers, pre-recorded the panel itself, which included a 10-minute discussion on our careers and backgrounds. And then we also mentioned our favorite science fiction movie or book, which helped us connect with the specific audience that AwesomeCon typically draws in, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we then did a live Q&A on the AwesomeCon Facebook page while our pre-recorded video aired alongside. So we were all online and in the chat box answering participants' questions in the moment. Uh, so I thought this was a great use of both pre-recording and live aspects. Uh, we had the benefit of making sure our panel looked great beforehand by pre-recording it. Um, but then we were also able to directly engage with participants during the actual uh, live event in the Q&A on their AwesomeCon's Facebook page. Um, so Sherelle, could you, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, so some tips for scientist engagement in a virtual setting. Um, a lot of these are just reiterating what Paige just mentioned. So one is to establish a connection with your audience. Um, so this is one, you want to make sure that you can connect with your, present yourself as someone who is not just uh, an abstract person, scientist, that's in a lab all the time. Um, you want to bring yourself into so that you can connect with your audience by talking about something you do, like as a hobby, like if you like gardening, or showing yourself in the field, or showing yourself at like an outreach event. Um, so Sherelle, if you can click twice. <laughs> so I always like to include a picture of myself at an outreach event. Um, usually with excited faces. <laughs> so on the left is um, me at an outreach event in um, Death Valley. And then on the right, I like to include a picture of me dressed up as Harry Potter because I love Harry Potter. And that just shows people that you are a human being. So it better connects um, yourself to the public or whoever you're talking to. Um, Cheryl, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And then another thing is you can use props. Um, you do want to make sure that they're easy to see, though. So people love seeing what you work on and how you do your work. Um, so this also helps in showcasing the diversity of what it means to, to be a planetary scientist. And using these props um, makes your presentation more interactive as well. Uh, so Charlotte, if you could click twice, please. So some examples include using a planetary globe or meteorites or rocks, or tools such as like a microscope or lasers if you use lasers in your lab. So in the left image is um, Natalie Curran. She's a planetary geologist at Goddard. She gave a live Skype a scientist type um, video recording, and she used uh, meteorites to show what the kids what she actually works on in the lab. And then on the right is Benny Pratt. Um, he was showing a model of the space shuttle and then the Hubble Space Telescope um, on top of it because he was working on the, he worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so this helped show what, uh, what the Space Telescope actually looks like and how it was uh, fit into a space shuttle. Um, so that helped connect those two individuals with their audiences. Um, and then the next slide, please. Thanks. And then just to reiterate, it's really important to provide the opportunity for people to ask questions. They don't just want to listen to you, they want to interact with you. And one way to do that is to either provide um, them the opportunity to, to ask questions in a chat box, 
um, or you can ask them to provide questions ahead of time, like if you're answering student questions. Um, and this way you're enabling your audience to be a part of the conversation and including them in your work. Um, and with that, I think we can move on to Sherelle. Absolutely. Sherelle, you're up. Thank you so much, Stacy. Awesome. So um, I want to talk to you all about the newest program, virtual program that we have um, kind of been, you know, forced into. You know, um, we were always, we've been talking about um, starting virtual programs, but during this time, we have just been kind of pushed to do it a little bit faster. And so I really appreciate that because doing adversity, it comes, you know, your creative self can now do things that you've been wanting to do. To do. So at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, we started DEEP, which stands for Virtual Exploration Experiences with Planetary Sciences. And um, during DEEP, it's basically a 30-minute online session that includes a live presentation by um, planetary scientists, not just ours. But um, because we have awesome planetary science at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, we uh, take advantage as, as much as we can. So um, our very first one was for a homeschool group. And Justin talked about um, the volcanism and Venus. And with this 30-minute interaction, of course, he presented um, how his personal connection, I think Justin is into baseball. So he established a personal connection with the homeschool group. And then we led into his presentation of um, Venus and uh, the, the volcanoes that he recently discovered that are actually active. And then we went into a demonstration led by Christine. And so here on the screen to your right, um, we use elephant toupee to mimic the pancake dome, as you can see on the on the brown cardboard there. And then we followed with Q and A. And we noticed that once we went back and uh, looked at the feedback, that the students were most, of course, they loved the the demonstration, but they really loved how Justin was there and present and engaged with their question and answer. So um, at the bottom, we put in um, evidence of that. And it said, I love the experiment with the elephant toothpaste. And I love meeting face to face with someone who is so knowledgeable and fun to learn from. So this just confirms what uh, Paige and what Stacey just said. They want that interaction back and forth. And so um, we're really excited about these, and I don't. I know that uh, in the in days to come, we're not. But this is just a program that is not going to die. We're going to keep this going on. And so um, other presentations um, were. Oh, I want to speak about uh, the audience in which we were impacting. So um, if you know Dr. Kendall Lynch, she's um, um, astrobiologist, and she is a lifelong Girl Scout. And she wanted to have her audience for Girl Scouts only. And so we are, we have put together um, a meeting for them to not only engage with her, with her science, her scientists, but also being able to get their, their uh, digital badge or their, their badge. And so one of the things that I like most about these is that we are reaching out to private and public audiences so they can um, they can engage with the sciences that we have access to. And Christine, I think that it's on you now. Okay, thank you, Sherelle. Um, folks, you're welcome to continue to, to put items in the chat box and in the questions. Um, Sherelle, we're going to pause on the sharing for just a second, um, and we're going to spend just a couple uh, uh, of, of seconds here. Um, I am going to share my camera to make it easier for everyone to see. Um, so this idea of a demonstration to engage an audience, this idea of, of engaging an audience by um, by showing them something up close and personal. You uh, would need to use your camera up close and make it big, like I've just done for you, hopefully, where, where you can see it larger. And 
so I'm going to give you an example of a demonstration that's unrelated to most of the things that we usually do. So, and I've got my chat box open so I can see what you're entering in the chat. Um, I've got something here. Does anyone know what this is? What do you think it might be? What is it? Um, type in answers. What is this? What is it for? You can see it's round. A ping pong ball. A couple of you are guessing maybe it's a ping pong ball. Um, oh, did you hear that? It's making noise. Huh. An antenna ball, an alien ball. Why, why is it doing that? It's, it's lighting. Why? Why is it lighting up and making noise? What, what, what about it is making it make noise and light up? Why? why? It's a talking ping pong ball, a Doppler ball. It's not a Doppler ball. Well, that's a good question. What do you think? Am I making a connection? I'm making a connection with my fingers. What do you all think about that? Do you think I'm making a connection? Connectivity. So, anyone have any ideas what you might use it for? How you could experiment with it? What could you do with it? I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to the PowerPoint while, while we continue this conversation. Sherelle, go ahead and bring back up the PowerPoint, please. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, so, sound. It makes sound. You could use it to make sound. What else could you do with it? Talk about the velocity of sound, absolutely. Something about the connectivity, about connecting with things. Um, so if you had this, is it something that you would want to play with maybe? Talk about safety with electricity. My goal right now was to use it to ask questions and to give you an opportunity to answer questions and to, to, to have a little bit of practice there with that. Um, and the more that you can ask questions, open-ended questions, as Stacy and Paige and Cheryl have all pointed out, the better, and give your, your participants an, an opportunity to do with it. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I've got just like one or two slides, and we are going to, please feel free to start asking your own questions. Get help. Uh, Paige had mentioned the decide, you know, the the idea of a facilitator. If you have an opportunity to plan and conduct your virtual engagement with a facilitator, with an educator, or even with a colleague, with somebody, a member of the audience, rather than trying to do it all by yourself, it makes it so much stronger. It makes it so much better, and it adds technological backup as well. Sherelle and I are backups for each other, where right now she's sharing the slides, but if one of us loses connectivity, the other one could start sharing slides while the, the first one calls in on the phone. So we've got lots of options there. Um, be clear about your roles, who's doing what. What, and, and make sure that everyone understands what they're doing and uh, that you uh, get input from people, from a member of your audience, from the facilitator, from the educator, to prepare for them to know more about them. Next slide. And um, more is less. So engaging people with interaction takes time. If your goals are to catch their attention, to spark their interest, to clarify some points, to practice a skill, to share something, the best way to do that, as you all said at the beginning, is to catch and keep their attention. And interaction, that engagement usually involves some sort of interaction, whether they're typing things or sharing things or speaking things or doing things. And that takes time. You're going to be very limited in the amount of content you can share in any virtual uh, interaction if you are going to actually interact with them. With that being said, what questions, suggestions, comments, and ideas do you have? Let's go ahead and please uh, feel free to, to unmute your microphone and say something. Please feel free to enter comments, ideas, and suggestions in the chat box. Um, some of you, and, and while, please start doing that now. Uh, Sherelle, next slide, and while we're doing that, um, I wanted to add, um, there was a question earlier and concerns about um, trying to, to reach diverse audiences, trying to reach, it's sometimes 
virtual engagement is difficult. People might have limited accessibility. Um, try to make sure that your presentation is something that someone can access on a phone. If you are recording it, people can watch it later. If you can, um, if you think that you might have some audience members who don't speak English well, uh, adding, um, slowing down things a little bit, adding visual cues, and lots of opportunity for people to ask questions and to provide feedback is great. So Judy, thank you. Yeah, voice quality makes it easier to listen to the speaker. So having a good microphone and, and uh, find out if people can hear you and clearly and understand you clearly. Other tips for accessibility. You have, uh, there's a question here about closed captioning. Actually, I have the ability with this and, and some programs do where I could assign someone, I could assign someone to be my closed caption person and uh, pick someone and ask them to type in throughout the presentation. So that is an option. You can ask somebody, you have to arrange in advance and you has to be somebody that you think is going to be very comfortable with typing very quickly and trying to keep up with what people are saying. But you can assign somebody to add closed captioning. And you can add a live interpreter, absolutely. That's a great idea. Um, have somebody have their camera on and have them uh, interpret as well with uh, uh, ASL. Partnering with somebody, good point. Um, if, um, if you think that you are reaching an audience that, um, let's say if, we, if we're doing uh, something for an audience that is predominantly Spanish speaker, we will reach out to some of our team members who speak Spanish fluently and, and they will be the stars because we need them. So interpreters are, are, are rad, absolutely. What other questions, thoughts, concerns do you have? Christine, I'll just uh, jump in and say that I do think that um, um, when you do ask a question of your audience, two things. One is, like Christine said, you're going to be using up some time. I generally let our presenters know you're going to lose, in a sense, two to three minutes to be able to go through what the question is, get answers, read answers, and then kind of bring it to a close. But the other thing I'll mention is, by having just a little instruction on the slide that says put your answers in the chat, it tells people how, they, how you want them to answer the question. Otherwise, it's like, wait, is that a question you want me to answer? Do I put it in the chat? Do I unmute my mic? So give them instructions on how you want them to be able to answer your question so that they know what, what they're supposed to do. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Paige. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that Sherelle and I have done um, with small groups is had them take turns turning on their microphone at the beginning so that they would be comfortable turning it on and off, having them take turns entering things in the chat so that they'd be comfortable doing both with small group. Um, captioning is important, absolutely, for people who are hard of hearing. And so, so yes. Um, and a tip, uh, make sure that the person is visible. Absolutely. Security. There's lots of things you can do for security. One of the things that we had enabled for this was we, uh, first of all, we've got it set so nobody except for Sherelle and I can actually share content. Nobody can annotate so people aren't scribbling all over our slides intentionally or by accident. Um, and we can tell who's entering things in the chat so we have the opportunity to, you know, if somebody is, is entering inappropriate content, we could kick them out. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so Zoom bombing is definitely an issue and having a facilitator to moderate and, and to take out anyone who is behaving inappropriately, especially if you've got family audiences. So, good points. Other suggestions or questions or concerns? And Stacy, Paige, Sorrell, if you have other things that you want to toss in now too, please do. I want to um, just pose a question to the audience that's participating. Um, and I want to direct your attention to the timer that's at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Has anyone else uh, found a useful tool regarding timers? 
um, for it to be embedded and that can be duplicated on multiple slides. Um, so yeah, I want to know. Timers, visual timers. Has anyone else found a, found such a solution? Sherelle put this one together for us. She's been using it. It's been very helpful in helping us keep track of things. Um, Sherelle, do you want to describe what it is you're using, what you did? Sure. I was hoping to get others, but of course I will. I would love to. All right, gang. So what you're seeing now is simply just called a desktop, a desktop timer. I did play around with uh, a timer that I could embed it to the PowerPoint, but guess what? It didn't go, when I advanced the slide, it didn't go over to the next slide. And if it did, it just restarted the timer over again. So it wasn't uh, consistently, you know, uh, changing the time for down. And so um, this is simply called a desktop timer. I, I just had to download it. Um, and so as you can see, as we were flipping and advancing the slides, the only way that it can be used, though, you have to be the one that share your screen. So if Christine shared and I still had and I had the desktop timer open, no one else could see it except me. So only the person that's sharing the slides can enable you to see the timer at the same time. And so I wanted uh, something that was small and less distracting just to keep everyone at pace. So um, that was just, just the solution that I came up with. And uh, just like I said, when we are in, um, when we're first, uh, at, when we're facing adversity, we get creative. <laughs> and so this is me trying to um, come up with a solution so we can keep ourselves paced. Thank you, Sherelle. Could you go ahead and bring us to the very last slide? I want to thank everyone for joining us. I have brought up a poll now with one question, um, but we also would love uh, other feedback. And so we've got um, a, a link there that you can um, go to uh, surveymonkey.com slash r slash sharing planetary science. If you go to that link, um, we have two other questions, two other short answer questions. We'd love your feedback on this event and, and welcome you to join us at others. Uh, if you have suggestions for other topics you would like us to address, please let us know. Past recordings and past presentations are online. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted online. And if you have other thoughts or questions. So let's see, Paul has a question about visual settings for the seminar, like backgrounds. Um, you can absolutely do a green screen and put a virtual background behind you. It's dependent on the quality of your computer's ability to adjust to it, though, it might be more distracting than helpful. But yes, um, in terms of, of, of settings for presentations. You don't want a bright light behind you. You want the light in front of you. You want the camera slightly above you um, rather than below you. That way people aren't looking up your nose and it's, it's a little bit more compelling. It reduces any double chins. Um, <laughs> you, um, you want a microphone that's nice and clear. A headset mic is kind of nice because it, it really does help and it reduces any background noise, kids walking in and slamming the doors, things like that that might be happening. You don't want clutter behind you. You don't want to be in a chair that is swiveling because it's very distracting if you happen to be doing this throughout the presentation. Um, and um, and so, so a simple, clean background behind you, dress professionally the same way that you would for an in-person. Uh, so if, if, if you would normally wear a suit, wear a suit. If you would normally wear a Hawaiian shirt, wear a Hawaiian shirt. Whatever you would normally use to engage that audience. Um, so, and yeah, people do like to see the backgrounds, but you don't really want the messy kitchen mm -hmm. pots and pans that are sitting in the sink that are dirty to be showing necessarily. Um, and you don't want the background to be a distraction. So authentic, be yourself. Yeah. Also, um, if I know Microsoft Teams allows you to use the blurrier background feature. Uh, just a tip, if you do use that and you use your hands, your hands might disappear. <laughs> so just keep that in mind if you ever use a blurrier background feature. Absolutely. I've seen people, uh, parts of their heads disappear. It can be a yeah. little. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, 
Feel free to contact us with your thoughts and suggestions. You can reach Sorrell and me at education at lpi.usra.edu. If you would like help in contacting Stacy or Paige, we can do that as well. Just send us an email. And we really, really appreciate your time today and hope that, that this was an enjoyable break in your day.